What is Shinzo Abe's legacy? Japan's longest serving prime minister has resigned. Described as a nationalist, he struggled to introduce aggressive economic reforms. So, how far has he succeeded? And how will Japanese remember him? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The surprise resignation of Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe sent shockwaves through the country's political establishment. The 65-year-old quit, citing health reasons related to ulcerative colitis, a chronic bowel disease that he's lived with since he was a teenager. Abe apologised to the Japanese people and said that he didn't want his illness to get into the way of decision-making. Al Jazeera's Priyanka Gupta takes a look now back at the career of Japan's longest-serving leader. A chronic illness that cut short his first term in office 13 years ago has come back to force Shinzo Abe, Japan's longest serving prime minister, to step down. I would like to sincerely apologize to the people of Japan for leaving my post with one year left in my term of office and amid the coronavirus woes, while various policies are still in the process of being implemented. <laughs> For most of the century, Shinzo Abe has dominated Japan's politics. He comes from an influential political dynasty. His grandfather was prime minister and his father foreign minister. The conservative politician rose through the ranks of his Liberal Democratic Party and became Japan's youngest prime minister since World War II in 2006. But that stint ended the following year due to ill health. Five years later, he returned. If his first term was marked by his political inexperience, the second had a renewed focus and agenda. What became known as Abenomics was a series of ambitious reforms aimed at boosting Japan's struggling economy. His vision of a wealthier, stronger Japan came with a lifelong ambition to amend the country's pacifist constitution, which bars it from hostile acts except in self-defense. Many Japanese opposed those constitutional changes. But he did manage to repeatedly win elections. As a result of the stability that he brought, the fact that he has won six national elections, that has basically been unimposed, uh, and really has shown um, no sign of losing his power really up until now in his, in his eighth year, that Japan has been well-governed, has been predictably and consistently governed for that period. And he has managed to translate that into a much more visible role for Japan in Asia and globally. Abe strengthened security and trade ties with the U.S., making Japan one of its closest allies. And despite territorial disputes, he warmed up to regional superpower China. And Japan's wartime legacy led to renewed friction with South Korea causing their worst diplomatic and trade dispute for decades. The 2011 earthquake, tsunami and Fukushima nuclear disaster was a further test of his leadership. Another came in 2020, when the coronavirus pandemic scuttled his plans to showcase Japan on the world stage by hosting the Tokyo Summer Olympics. The world's third largest economy already on the slide since 2018 slumped to a record low. Abe's resignation has set off a succession battle in the ranks of the governing Liberal Democratic Party and their concerns about what the future holds for a country long used to stability. Priyanka Gupta, Al Jazeera. Let's bring in our guests then from Tokyo. We're joined by Tomohiko Taniguchi, special advisor to the cabinet of Shinzo Abe and professor at Keio University. From Canberra, Lauren Richardson, director of studies at Australian National University's Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy. And also in Tokyo is David Laney, a professor of Japanese politics at Waseda University. Thank you all for being with us. Tomohiko Taniguchi, let's start with you. What's your reaction to Abe's resignation? He was Japan's longest serving prime minister, but was he a good prime minister? How will history judge him? History will judge him 
as someone that has uh, who has brought Japan uh, closer to countries such as Australia, India, and perhaps the UK and France and so on, uh, someone who has uh, been able to revisit Japan's true self, its identity, that is uh, Japan's, um, uh, uh, that is uh, maritime democracy. Uh, so that's uh, an external factor. Domestically, uh, long awaited was an element of hope without which any nation, including Japan, could not grow. For a wealthy and declining population uh, country such as Japan, uh, what's most important is to uh, hope for the best for the future, especially for the young generations. And Shinzo Abe was right in the middle of rewriting its social contract by uh, shifting the weight of the um, uh, 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 social welfare program uh, slightly from the elderly to the younger generations so that uh, the childbearing cost is going to be lower still for the future. But many things are uh, in the midway and certainly uh, abduction case, the uh, North Korean government um, sponsored actions uh, brought uh, many Japanese citizens to North Korea, mm. the abductees are still in North Korea, and Shinzo Abe has not been able to bring them back to Japan to his greatest uh, greatest regret. Uh, Lauren Richardson, Abe is a pragmatist who throughout his tenure sought to strengthen alliances across Asia, including with China, uh, but relations with South Korea have sunk to historic lows. Why was that? Is it, is it Abe's fault or the fault of Moon Jae-in, or them both? Yeah, um, it's it's an important question. Obviously, the relationship between Japan and South Korea is a really uh, crucial one in the region because they both have a shared ally in the US. And obviously, that alliance system becomes stronger when um, Japan and South Korea are getting along. Um, I don't think we can clearly attribute that deterioration to Abe or to Moon. I think there's been some major changes in the relationship that have uh, developments in both countries that have um, coincided with the Abe administration. So one of the major complicating developments is some of the South Korean judicial outcomes in recent years, um, especially the 2018 Supreme Court case um, that ruled um, Japanese companies that use Korean labor in World War II need to compensate um, those laborers. But Abe's position, and this is um, mirrored um, by his LDP or Liberal Democratic Party counterparts, is that all of those issues were resolved in 1965. Um, so what we see is a major, I guess, a, a gulf that has emerged in the, in the two opinions of the two leaders. Um, President Moon argues that that treaty they signed in 1965 did not nullify the rights of victims because it didn't have the input of the victims. And he also argues that the separation of powers in, in South Korea um, obliges him to abide by the ruling. So I think, yeah, the two leaders' positions on the post-colonial settlement, settlement are diametrically opposed. David Laney. How do you see Abe's legacy? He was instrumental in bringing the Olympics to Japan. How much of a blow to him personally will it be not to be the man in charge when and if the postponed games actually take place? Oh, I think it'll be heartbreaking for him personally, although I think it's probably secondary among his concerns at the moment. And obviously, like most people, I wish him good health. I do think that probably when we think back upon his legacy, it's partly going to be about the way in which he likely reshaped the decision-making structure in Tokyo. I mean, for we've sort of come to take it for granted that Japanese prime ministers last for a while. Prime Minister Koizumi back in the early 2000s lasted for six years. And now with Prime Minister Abe having served for nearly eight, 
it's a fairly remarkable stretch, but for the most part, Japanese prime ministers are short-term caretakers over a fractious political system. We may return to that, and I think that what will be problematic is that Abe has been very, very shrewd and very effective at centralizing a lot of the decision-making in the hands of the prime minister and his team. And so what will happen if there's a series of short-term prime ministers after him may mean not so much policy instability as policy and direction. So we'll be looking, I think, to figure out whether or not there's going to be a sustainable legacy from the from the Abe years beyond, uh, beyond this. With regard to the Olympics, I do think the Olympics are going to go ahead if the IOC says they want to have them go ahead. And that will be dictated by the direction of the COVID-19 virus. Tomohiko, who's likely to replace Abe? Had he groomed a successor? Um, the answer is, I don't know. The contest is going to soon take place within the LDP. It's going to be a party affair. And there are a couple, uh, probably several, contenders for the presidency of the ruling party. And uh, um, many names are being rumored. And Shinzo Abe clearly distanced, chose to distance himself from the decision-making process for those um, uh, candidates. Lauren, what were Abe's foreign policy successes and failures? Will relations, at least between Japan and South Korea, improve with someone else at the helm? It's a good question. I think there's, there definitely have been some successes. I think that Abe has really um, in, increased Japan's presence on the global stage. And as mentioned by Mr. Taniguchi, he has also really strengthened not only the US-Japan alliance, um, which was really put to the test with the idiosyncrasies of the Trump administration, or really the Trump leadership, um, but at the same time, he's really improved and deepened ties with Japan's other strategic partners in the region, um, including Australia and India. And at the same time, he's deepened relations in the South Pacific and also Southeast Asia with countries that are quite vulnerable to Chinese influence. So he's really expanded the scope of um, Japan's, I guess, um, well, foreign policy. And I think at the same time, when it comes to South Korea, I don't expect to see any improvement um, with Abe's successor. And I think it's because Abe's position on the 1965 treaty um, is widely supported, not only in the Liberal Democratic Party, where his successor is obviously very likely to come from, um, but also in the wider conservative establishment in Japan. I mean, it's, it's very deeply entrenched that these issues are resolved, especially issues pertaining to Korean labor um, from the colonial period. So I, I expect there's only going to be change at some point in the future, Perhaps if there's a, maybe a change of party in Japan, if we see the opposition party come to power, or if we see a, maybe a, a change of leadership in South Korea, which will obviously happen um, in the fairly near future. David, to what extent did his handling of the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear disaster impact upon his reputation both at home and abroad? Well, he wasn't actually prime minister at the time of the disaster. The, the prime minister at the time of the disaster was Prime Minister Khan, Nao, Naoto Khan, uh, who was then succeeded by another prime minister of the Democratic Party, which was then defeated in a subsequent election by the LDP that brought uh, Abe back to power in 2012. And so he, in some ways, benefited from the disaster insofar as it implied to many voters that the DPJ was incapable of actually handling a policy disaster. Whether that's a fair assessment or not is another matter. But Abe himself, in some ways, moved the direction of the discussion because as much as the as much as Japan started to move towards an anti-nuclear strategy, Abe himself started to push for uh, wider dependence upon nuclear power. That hasn't been hasn't been successful yet, and it's not clear it will be. But certainly what Abe has been trying to do has been to return Japan to what he would imply would be a sustainable energy future dependent on nuclear energy. And that's in some ways been one of the greatest legacies that he'll have from, the, uh, from his handling of the outcomes of the Fukushima disaster. Tomohiko, will, will Japan continue on its current economic and diplomatic course under its new leader? Uh, what do you see as Abe's successor's main priorities now? The fact of the matter is Japan's got no luxury 
uh, whereby you could choose one from the other. The options available for Japan's future are actually narrow, either on the domestic front or on the foreign policy front. In the foreign policy uh, area, uh, Japan's, need, Japan's need is going to be the same to strengthen ever more the U.S.-Japan alliance, uh, the linchpin of the security arrangement across the region. And then uh, Japan's got to invest further into its relationships with like-minded maritime democracies such as Australia, India, and so on and so forth. Domestically, the productivity is the key uh, because Japan's declining population is very much uh, incurable, uh, at least in the short term. And uh, uh, for a wealthy country to grow further, uh, there is only one way left, that is to boost your productivity, which is hard to come by, which is the reason why con continuity and consistency are among the most important assets uh, expected uh, uh, to be held by the next uh, prime minister and the prime minister after the next. Uh, otherwise, uh, people couldn't uh, expect long term, uh, couldn't uh, hope for the future in the long-term perspectives. And long-term investment is going to uh, not to take shape when and where you don't have uh, much expectation for the future. Lauren, um, he changed the status quo of Japan's defense policy to enable uh, a more proactive security role in the region. Just how different uh, today is Japan as a, as a regional power, thanks to Shinzo Abe? I think Japan is very different, and I think that will be one of um, Prime Minister Abe's um, main legacies, I think, because we all know that his primary objective was to change Japan's defence posture at a constitutional level um, by changing the pacifist clause um, um, that sort of prohibits Japan um, from being a so-called normal um, security actor. But Abe was able to work around that um, clause by you know, sort of legislating around it to enable Japan to participate in collective self-defense, something that was considered unconstitutional before. Also by acquiring um, like substantially more military assets, some that were previously relegated to the no-go zone that could be, you know, in some ways considered offensive um, rather than defensive. Um, also removing an arms export ban, um, starting to export arms. And just generally, I think, um, by articulating a new strategic framework that included the US, Japan, Australia and India, the quadrilateral, or it's known as the quad um, for short. And by, yeah, generally playing a leadership role in the security of the region, particularly around the South China Sea issues. I think that's a major change. David, to what extent, we touched upon it in the report just before we began our discussion, but to what extent was he influenced by his paternal grandfather, who was once jailed as a war crime suspect, but went on to serve as prime minister in 1957? That's a great question. He, he himself says that he's been influenced quite a bit when he wrote his book, in, uh, Japan the Beautiful, uh, just before he became prime minister the first time in 2006. He actually spoke quite a bit about the way in which his grandfather had been treated and he felt unfairly by the press and by historians. Leaving that aside, he himself has long argued that one of the main problems for Japan has been its inability to express national pride because of a kind of history that's been forced upon it by, for, by, by dint of its having lost the war and having been occupied by the United States afterwards. And so part of his mission in the post-war era has been, and, and during his era, has been to try to get Japanese to rethink what it means to be Japanese and to rethink uh, their, their, their history. The reason I think that that's controversial um, is not only because the way in which it recast some of Japan's behavior during the war and has obviously upset a bunch of Japan's neighbors, but also because the way in which it recasts some of what he suggests he wants Japan to be able to do in the future. Well, I believe he's absolutely sincere that his foreign policy goals are simply designed to protect Japan. The fact that his efforts to recast Japanese history in a way that suggests Japan's move, Japan's maneuvers during the interwar era were driven in part by the exigencies of global politics rather than by a sort of aggressive imperial set of moves, 
that's raised concerns about whether or not he or others have designs to re to rebuild some kind of military empire. I think they don't, but I do think that he's left himself vulnerable to that because of the way he talks somewhat romantically about Japan's past and the way in which he's aligned himself with key figures in the so-called revisionist right. Uh, Tomohiko, he strengthened security and trade ties with the U.S. He kind of thawed relations with China. What are we to make of his apparently deft handling of the, the unpredictable Trump administration? Whoever is uh, in the highest office in the United States, of the United States, it is incumbent upon the Japanese prime minister to cultivate the best possible, the deepest possible uh, relationship with the POTUS of the day. And that's what Shinzo Abe has done uh, both with uh, Barack Obama and with Donald Trump. One could only hope his successor uh, is going to do the same. And by the way, not only with Japan, uh, not only with uh, the United States, Japan under Shinzo Abe has gotten very close also to European countries, EU, Japan, Free Trade Pact, Economic Partnership Agreement is among the biggest and the richest in terms of coverage ever uh, forged uh, between and among rich nations. So uh, under Shinzo Abe, Japan's uh, being able to bring itself closer to democratic nations on the European front as well. And that's going to uh, make up uh, pretty much an important part of Japanese identity now and down the road. Uh, Lauren, um, we're rapidly running out of time here, and I, I want to get another question into David. So um, uh, if you could be as brief as possible, I'd be grateful. Uh, while popular enough to win six national elections, bringing stability and relative prosperity to Japan, he did have a knack for courting controversy. He repeatedly visited the uh, Yasukuni Shrine. Was that a deliberate attempt to be provocative on his part? Uh, which audience was he playing to when he was doing that, a domestic one or an international one? Yeah, I think Prime Minister Abe is not alone in this. Some of his predecessors um, have also done the same, visited this controversial Yasukuni Shrine. I think definitely not trying to provoke <laughs> you know, China and South Korea, but definitely pandering to domestic um, constituencies, particularly the conservative constituency that typically votes for the LDP and would like, you know, um, the prime minister to pay his respects to the war dead, um, yeah, in Japan. And David, um, what are we to make of the timing of his departure? We know that ill health has plagued him throughout his life and forced him to, to end his, his first tenure as Prime Minister. Is there, is there more to it this time than, than, than just ill health? Uh, is the timing of, it, of this announcement, of his resignation, significant? Well, it's hard to know. Um, I, I, some of the more conspiracy-minded observers in Japan have noted that the first time he resigned, it was shortly after he had passed his one-year tenure, so he wouldn't just be a less than one one year prime minister, and then resigns because of ill health. This time, it was just a couple of days after he broke the record of Prime Minister Sato Eisaku for, for longest serving continuous uh, prime minister's tenure. And so I think some have suggested that he really realized his time was about up and just wanted to make certain he had the record. I don't really believe that's true. And he actually did seem to me to be quite physically unwell during the, pro the press conference that he held. But it was clear that he was on his way out. His popularity was declining in part because of the economic ravages uh, inflicted on Japan and other countries by the COVID-19 virus, by a series of scandals that he didn't handle terribly adeptly, and by just, I think, fatigue among a number of voters with his cabinet's inability to point to a, a, a new direction in structural reforms for the economy. So I think that he, this was probably the time that he would be going sometime this year he, I think he would have held on through the end of the year if the Olympics had taken place. But I think with the uncertainty surrounding them, there was really no reason to risk his health any further. There, I'm afraid we must leave it. Many thanks indeed. Tomohiko Taniguchi, Lauren Richardson and David Laney. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Don't forget, you can see the programme again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team, many thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.